Anna lives alone in her house. As usual she prepared lunch. But when the woman was pulling the chicken casserole out of the oven, a series of terrible memories caused her to drop the dish. Now Anna, who lives in Canterbury Hill, is divorced and abuses wine. Her ex-husband used to say she had a vivid imagination, and it's true. Seeing the neighbor getting her children ready for school, Anna remembered that she and her daughter Elizabeth were also running late. Anna found herself outside the school building, completely disoriented. She was only wearing pajamas and a robe. The neighbor Carol Sullivan worriedly called out to Anna, who assured that everything was fine. Carol thinks Anna should start dating again. It's been three years since her divorce, and it's time to move on. Carol even found a potential boyfriend for Anna. Out of politeness Anna agreed to meet him. Later, Anna noticed movers carrying furniture into the house across the street. It seems she has new neighbors. At home, Anna opened another bottle of wine. It's her only solace. Periodically Anna checks her ex-husband Douglas's Instagram. They used to be truly happy, but at some point everything changed. Anna watches her new neighbor and his young daughter, whose name is Emma through the window. It seems the guy doesn't have a wife. Anna listened to a voicemail from Sloan, her best friend and gallery administrator. Anna gave up painting a long time ago, but Sloan still tries to convince her to get back to it. In the evening, Anna was preparing for the upcoming date. Like now, Anna often talks to her daughter Elizabeth, who passed away three years ago. Anna always forgets this. She abandoned the idea of going on the date, not understanding how she could move on when the past feels so real. Indignant Carol, who had organized the date, sent her several voice messages. That same evening, Anna found out that her ex-husband had a new girlfriend. Suddenly hearing strange noises upstairs, Anna went to check what was going on. She felt a strange presence in the house. Wine is now Anna's only salvation. Unlike her, Douglas has found the strength to at least partially let go of the past. Anna's attention was drawn to the neighbor in the window across the street. He turned out to be quite handsome. In the morning Anna, who had fallen asleep right on the couch, was woken up by a knock at the door. Standing on the doorstep was the neighbor Neil, who handed Anna a bouquet. However the bouquet wasn't from him, a courier had left it earlier. In this strange way their acquaintance happened. By the way the bouquet was sent by Sloan, hoping it would inspire Anna. Later, she went to her daughter's grave and spoke to her, as she does every day. Outside the house Anna met Emma, Neil's daughter who was selling cookies. Before the tragedy, Elizabeth was the same age. Of course Anna bought some cookies. It turned out that the girl's mother had passed away. Anna promised Emma she would bring them a delicious chicken casserole that evening. Later, Anna made the dish and was about to take it to her neighbors when suddenly it started raining. Anna has a panic fear of rain, so she fainted right on the road. Neil brought Anna to her senses and helped her get home. Anna explained that she suffers from ombrophobia, a fear of rain. Neil shared that his wife had passed away some time ago. It was a tragic accident on a lake. Anna in turn shared her own tragedy. Noticing Anna's paintings on the walls, Neil expressed his admiration. His wife by the way was also into art. Anna said she no longer paints. They agreed to have coffee together sometime. Before leaving, Neil suggested Anna return to painting, saying she had talent. Anna went up to the attic, where all her painting supplies were stored. A bird startled her, and she ran down the stairs in fear, quickly taking a sedative. In the evening reading a book in bed with a glass of wine, Anna saw Neil in the window across the street. He noticed her interest and headed towards her house. This made Anna nervous, but she allowed Neil inside. They didn't say a word to each other, a passion ignited between them. Anna woke up on the couch, realizing it had all just been a dream. The next day, she made another chicken casserole and brought it to the neighbors. Neil invited Anna to have dinner with them. She eagerly agreed. They had a great time, laughing and enjoying the delicious food. Emma saw in Anna the mother she missed so much. Both Neil and Anna have felt lonely since losing their loved ones. There was a spark between them, though they weren't yet ready to admit it to each other. Tonight for the first time, Anna didn't feel anxious before bed. By the way she subscribed to Neil on Instagram. Anna used to believe that monsters lived in her house. So how real are they? Waking up in the morning, Anna smiled. She seriously considered starting to paint again. Later on the street, Anna ran into Lisa, Neil's girlfriend who works as a flight attendant, so she's often away. This threw Anna off balance. Seeing Lisa, Neil and Emma hugging, Anna felt a deep disappointment. This prompted her to go to the store and buy wine again. There, she overheard Carol gossiping with another woman about her. They called Anna a crazy alcoholic who flirts with her neighbor despite him having a girlfriend. On her way home, Anna was shocked to see Lisa throwing away the felt tip pens had given to Emma. Her outrage knew no bounds. Lisa explained it by the fact that the felt tip pens had a strange smell. The women smiled at each other, 
masking their mutual hatred behind those smiles. At home, Anna poured herself more wine and got a call from her therapist, who was concerned about her condition. Anna was tired of these conversations. When the therapist suggested she come for a session, Anna replied that she couldn't drive that far, considering it could rain at any moment. The doctor said her fear of rain wasn't surprising since it had poured on the worst day of her life. Anna remembered that fateful day when Douglas was about to take their daughter with him to work. When heavy rain began, Anna handed them an umbrella. Douglas is a forensic psychiatrist, and the daughter was very interested in his work. Elizabeth entered the room where a dangerous serial criminal Mike was sitting. Before the session began, Douglas's boss called him in urgently. The prison warden accidentally locked the door, leaving Elizabeth alone with Mike. Anna cut off the call with the therapist, no longer able to talk about it. Watching Lisa through the window, Anna noticed that she had two phones. Could Lisa be hiding something? All day Anna continued to drink wine, watching Neil's perfect life from the window. Anna wished she could be in Lisa's shoes. By the way Neil accepted Anna's friend request on Instagram. His page was full of pictures of Emma and Lisa, whom Anna considered a narcissistic fool. Since Anna wasn't answering calls, Sloane decided to visit her. Anna told her about the handsome new neighbor and his questionable girlfriend. Anna was convinced that Lisa was a danger to Neil and Emma. Moreover, one user had been liking all of Lisa's Instagram photos, which seemed suspicious. Unfortunately his profile was private. Of course Sloane thought Anna was delusional and advised her not to interfere in someone else's family. Maybe if she returned to painting, she could distract herself. Anna decided to follow the advice. Her hands remembered everything. But at some point, Anna got so angry that she ruined the canvas. Seeing Carol outside talking to the mailman, Anna went out and yelled at her, thinking the woman was spreading gossip again. Carol assured that she was talking to the mailman about an important letter for her husband Scott. Anna's behavior only confirmed that she was crazy. In the afternoon, Anna visited her daughter's grave again. She feels like her life is falling apart. The weather started to get worse and to avoid getting caught in the rain, Anna hurried home, barely making it. The first thing she did was drink wine. Despite everything, Anna continues spying on Lisa. That user who keeps liking Lisa's post still hasn't accepted Anna's friend request. She decided to create a new account with more provocative photos and sent a friend request to Rex Baki again. This time he accepted the request. Anna browsed through Rex's profile and saw a picture of him with Lisa from five days ago. That evening, Anna was drinking heavily again. Suddenly she saw Lisa through the window trying to clamp down on a deep wound. Moments later she collapsed. In a panic Anna called 911. Despite the heavy rain, she ran toward the house across the street but lost consciousness halfway there. Later, someone carried unconscious Anna back to her house. Anna woke up to the sound of police sirens. Detective Lane and Officer Walters asked her what she had seen. Anna recounted how it all went down. The detective noticed a bottle of wine on Anna's table. Moreover according to the police, Lisa was fine, she was on a flight at this moment. Lisa is a flight attendant for Olympia Airlines. Detective Lane suggested that due to the alcohol and medication, Anna had experienced hallucinations. However, Anna insisted that a crime had taken place in the house across the street. Before leaving, the police advised Anna to sober up and think about how to apologize to her neighbor. Anna no longer understood what was real and what was fantasy. Any sound in the house made her jump. Anna sought comfort in sedatives and wine. The next morning, she felt completely broken. Gathering her courage Anna went to Neil, who was very displeased. According to him, Lisa had flown to Seattle yesterday alive and well, and they had even texted this morning. Neil was already aware of Anna's alcohol addiction. Perhaps combined with the grief she had endured, it had driven her mad. Anna wanted to go inside Neil's house, but he wouldn't let her. All the neighbors knew what had happened the night before. Carol didn't even want to listen to Anna, believing everything she said was nonsense. Waiting for the neighbor to leave, Anna broke her flashlight and called over the mailman, Buell. He had no idea how it could have happened. Anna asked Buell to go to the hardware store, and while he was gone, she snuck into the neighbor's house. There were no traces on the carpet, but Anna found one of Lisa's earrings on the floor. Anna's attention was drawn to a family photo on the mantel. Suddenly Neil and Emma returned home, catching Anna in the act. The man was furious. Anna tried to explain that Lisa was no longer alive and that she wasn't who she claimed to be. Neil demanded that Anna get out of his house and never come near him or Emma again. Anna had no choice but to leave. Even Sloane didn't believe her story. Sometimes Anna sees things that aren't there, and Elizabeth is proof of that. At that moment, Anna realized she needed help and went to group therapy. Anna shared that she couldn't come to terms with losing her daughter. During the break, a woman named Aileen approached Anna. Their daughters had gone to school together. Aileen was here because she had lost her brother. 
Aileen regretted not supporting Anna three years ago in the way she should have. But Anna realized that any words would have been useless. On the bulletin board, Anna saw an advertisement for a three-day tour to Miami. Anna began convincing herself that she wasn't crazy and took a flyer. At the airport, she found out that Olympia Airlines wasn't flying to the West Coast until next year, which meant Lisa couldn't possibly be in Seattle right now. Anna immediately told Detective Lane about this and handed over the earring, but the officer still didn't believe her. Anna suggested that Rex, Lisa's other boyfriend, had found out about Neil and had taken her life. The detective remained convinced that Anna had simply gone mad from grief because what had happened to her daughter was the kind of nightmare that only happens in the worst scenarios. Lane had been new on the job when serial criminal Mike Ennis was subjected to a polygraph test. Looking into his eyes, Lane saw pure evil. At that moment she wanted to rid the world of Mike, but the police are meant to carry out justice, not revenge. If Lane had done something back then, Elizabeth would still be alive. But the past couldn't be changed. In the parking lot outside the police station, Anna saw a message written on her car window, stop, or you are next. Since the police didn't believe her, Anna decided to start her own investigation and called the FBI records department, pretending to be Douglas Whitaker's assistant. Since Anna had some of her ex-husband's documents, she was able to provide his identification number and sent a request for information about Lisa Maines and Rex Bakke. There was a knock at the door. It was Emma with some almond chocolates. The father had forbidden her to come here, but the girl wanted to cheer up the neighbor. Anna gave her Elizabeth's plush duck and showed her a picture of Rex, asking if she had ever seen him. The girl said no. When asked if she had heard anything the night the police came, Emma said that her father and Lisa had argued. According to her, the father often gets angry. Anna began to suspect that behind closed doors, Neil behaves very differently than he does in public. She told Emma to come here anytime if she got scared. Suddenly Anna and Neil's eyes met as he stood by the window. Later, Anna searched the internet for information about the demise of Neil's wife, Meredith. Maybe it wasn't an accident after all. Some time ago Neil, his wife and daughter were on vacation by a lake. They had a cabin nearby. As usual there was a conflict between the spouses. Neil was unhappy with his wife's constant fears. Meredith in turn was afraid of her husband, who often lost control. In the heat of the argument Neil pushed his wife into the water. Emma witnessed it. Since Meredith couldn't swim, she wasn't able to get out. This was the version that Anna adhered to, not realizing how she could have been so wrong about Neil Coleman. But he had been cleared of all suspicion, and Meredith's demise was ruled an accident. Anna also discovered that Meredith had a sister, Hilary Layton, who lived in Millbury. She surely knew something. Thanks to Instagram and her wit, Anna found Hilary's address and planned to visit her, but Sloane's sudden arrival delayed her plans. Sloane asked the friend how her first group therapy session had gone. Anna assured that it was doing her good. The trip didn't take long. Anna introduced herself as a friend of Meredith's. Hillary invited her inside. The women looked through a photo album together. Anna casually asked about Meredith and Neil's relationship. Hillary had never trusted Neil, suspecting that he was unfaithful to his wife. By the way Neil forbade his daughter from speaking to her aunt. Hillary mentioned that shortly after losing her mother, Emma endured another tragedy, her teacher from St. Philip's school had perished. Hillary could no longer continue the conversation. After thanking the, the woman for her hospitality, Anna headed to St. Philip's Elementary School. It turned out that Miss Patrick had perished during a field trip to the lighthouse. Somehow the unfortunate woman had fallen from a great height. Anna wanted to know if Neil Coleman had been on that trip. She drove to the nearest lighthouse. Perhaps the tragedy had occurred there. At one point Anna tripped and nearly fell off a cliff, but she was saved by Wallace Faulkner, the lighthouse keeper. Anna introduced herself as a reporter. Wallace told her about the teacher's demise at the lighthouse. He couldn't say for sure which parents had been present, as school trips were held here regularly. There was one today as well. Anna asked an elderly woman, a photographer, if she had any photos from previous excursions. The woman kept negatives. That's how Anna confirmed that Neil had been on that field trip. Perhaps Miss Patrick had been his lover. And taking advantage of the fact that the children were distracted, they had secluded themselves in the lighthouse. The woman might have been concerned that too little time had passed since Neil's wife had died. When she suspected that Neil was involved in Meredith's demise, he pushed her off the lighthouse. Anna bought the photo from the elderly woman for $5. That evening, Anna noticed a girl arriving at Neil's house. Emma was clearly happy to see the visitor. Perhaps she was the nanny. At home, Anna as usual poured herself a glass of wine. Then she saw through the window that Neil was loading a heavy bag into the trunk of his car. Anna was sure it was Lisa's body. Anna followed Neil in her car. However he noticed that she was spying on him. Anna told Neil that she knew he had taken the lives of his wife, his teacher and Lisa. 
Neil was tired of being a victim of Anna's madness. Lisa was alive, and what happened with Meredith and Miss Patrick had been a series of unfortunate accidents. Anna couldn't believe Neil until she saw the contents of his bag. Neil allowed her to check, just to get her off his back. Inside there was a ventriloquist dummy, styled to look like Neil himself. After his wife's demise, he had taken up ventriloquism as a distraction. Now he occasionally performed on stage. Neil kept his hobby a secret, not wanting people to gossip about him. In tears Anna ran away. Maybe she really was losing her mind. Anna received a call from the FBI records department. There was no information on Lisa Maines, unlike Rex Bakke. She didn't get to hear the rest because Rex grabbed her. She lied that her husband would be home any minute. Rex forced Anna to text Douglas asking him to go to the store and buy bread to delay the time. Of course Douglas found this message strange. Rex was here for answers. He thought Anna and Lisa were conspiring against him. Anna assured that wasn't true. Rex began walking through every room, calling out for chastity, it was Lisa's real name. Anna insisted that Lisa was no longer alive, but Rex knew that wasn't true because he had spoken to her recently. The police arrived, throwing Rex into a panic. He threatened Anna that if she said a word to the police about him, her daughter would suffer. Anna told him that Elizabeth had been gone for a long time, so Rex couldn't take anything away from him. The police were knocking insistently on the door. She opened it, trying to remain calm, and asked what was going on. Rex was hiding in the pantry the whole time. Detective Lane explained to Anna that her neighbor Neil Coleman had called them. Under the pretense of fetching sugar for coffee, Anna went into the pantry. Rex made no sound. Officer Walters handed Anna Whitaker a restraining order, prohibiting her from approaching Neil Coleman and his daughter. Anna understood why Neil had done this. She was lucky he hadn't sued. After the police left, Anna saw the nanny arriving at Neil's house again. Rex came out of his hiding spot, thanking Anna. She offered him some wine. Anna hadn't turned Rex into the police just because she wanted to know who Chastity really was. Rex suggested that Chastity had faked her demise, knowing that Anna was watching her from the window across the street. It would benefit Chastity if Rex believed she was perished, as that would mean Neil's money would go entirely to her. She and Rex had planned to rob Neil together, but it seemed Chastity had decided to do without her partner. They had met in a nightclub, where Chastity was a bartender and Rex was a dancer. Together they pulled off their first scam. Chastity introduced Rex as her terminally ill brother, and her elderly suitor wrote a large check. The bank account was in Rex's name, but only Chastity knew the pin. A month later, she broke up with her boyfriend. Chastity and Rex had done this many times, intentionally targeting wealthy widowers. Neil became one of their victims. Chastity had come up with a sob story about her husband dying two months ago. Neil took the bait because he had recently suffered a loss himself. The plan worked perfectly. But this time there was a complication. Neil had a child. Rex didn't like that and wanted out of the game, but Chastity threatened to turn him into the police since the bank account was in his name. Shortly after Chastity disappeared, but today she resurfaced by texting Rex. Their conversation was interrupted by the sound of a car engine outside. Anna explained that it was her ex-husband. Of course after receiving Anna's strange message, Douglas had been worried and couldn't help but come by. Anna assured him that everything was fine, she had supposedly been afraid it would rain, so she asked him to buy bread. Douglas brought not only bread but also Anna's favorite caramels. They were genuinely happy to see each other. Anna would have given anything to have her family back. Seeing Douglas's new girlfriend in his car filled her with disappointment. Meanwhile, Rex went into Elizabeth's room. He thought he heard a noise, so he went upstairs. Memories of her daughter caused Anna pain. She blamed herself for asking the husband to take their daughter to work that fateful day. Anna had just wanted to make Elizabeth happy. Rex didn't want to leave and said how sorry he was. Suddenly they kissed. Anna hadn't experienced something like that in a long time. Passion arose between them. Carol who noticed them was shocked. Neither Anna nor Rex knew about Chastity's body in the woods. When Anna walked into the kitchen, she saw Rex making breakfast. Anna had never dealt with bad boys before, and Rex had never dealt with good girls. The passionate moment was interrupted by a knock on the door. Detective Lane urged Anna to stay quiet. The police stormed the house, arresting Rex for taking Chastity Linkless's life. Rex denied any involvement. All the neighbors including Neil, Emma and Carol witnessed it. Later, Detective Lane explained to confused Anna that the crimes unit had been wiretapping Rex and Chastity's phones for months to gather evidence. Anna couldn't believe Rex did it, so Detective Lane played one of the recordings where he threatened Chastity. Additionally, the detective knew that Anna had hidden Rex in her pantry the previous day, which was stupid of her. Anna remembered Rex showing her the last messages from Chastity. The detective was convinced that Rex had taken Chastity's phone and used it to create an alibi for himself. Before leaving, 
Detective Lane advised Anna to just move on with her life. Anna really did decide to change her life, pouring all her wine down the sink and flushing her pills down the toilet. She also did some minor renovations in the living room. Sloan suggested they get a manicure together. Anna agreed, thanking the friend for always supporting her no matter what. Sloan had good news, she had been invited to manage a new gallery in New York. Even though Sloan would have to move, Anna was genuinely happy for her. Outside the house Anna asked the mailman, Buell, to help her open the door, as her nail polish hadn't dried yet. When Anna noticed a wound on the man's palm, she was shocked. But Buell didn't seem to feel any pain. Anna invited him inside and treated his wound. Buell thanked her for her kindness. Even his own parents had never cared for him like that. Today was Elizabeth's birthday, and Anna brought the daughter's favorite dish, chicken casserole to her grave. Judging by the card and the plush turtle, Douglas had already been here. Anna didn't expect to see Neil and Emma here, coming from Chastity's funeral. Neil now knew that his lover had been a con artist, but she still didn't deserve such a fate. Neil apologized to Anna for not believing her. They agreed to have dinner together that evening. Meanwhile in the woods where Chastity's body had been found, the forensics team was working. Detective Lane was shocked when she saw the crime weapon. A storm was approaching. Anna decided to try painting something. Despite the long break, it came surprisingly easily to her. There was a knock at the door. Standing there were Detective Lane and Officer Spitz, who intended to search the house. Anna didn't object. The detective stated that Rex had been released from custody because he had a solid alibi. That meant the real culprit was someone else. Detective Spitz found a paint spatula in the attic, identical to the one found at the crime scene. This made Anna the prime suspect in the case. Maybe she wanted to get Chastity's boyfriend. The officers found a canvas depicting Anna, Neil and Emma with the caption The Perfect Family. Anna didn't remember painting it. She was arrested. Neil and Emma saw it happen. Anna swore she was innocent. Or maybe she just didn't remember? At the police station Anna was interrogated. The officers had already spoken to Carol, who described Anna as crazy. Detective Lane was curious about how long Anna had known chastity. Anna claimed it was just one day. Anna's fingerprints were taken. Then Detective Lane continued the interrogation, asking why she preferred painting flowers. Anna explained that she used to paint mostly landscapes and as a beginner artist, barely made ends meet. But one day she painted her dog as the Mona Lisa, and people loved it. Orders just poured in. It became Anna's trademark, incorporating dogs into famous art masterpieces. However, Anna experienced a creative crisis. During her pregnancy, when she was in the hospital due to the threat of premature birth, a nurse brought her an incredibly beautiful bouquet. In that moment, Anna felt inspiration bloom inside her. That's how Anna returned to painting. She was fascinated by flowers, so fragile yet full of life. Anna stopped painting again after Elizabeth passed away. Of course Anna was embittered against the world, but that didn't make her a criminal. The detective insisted that all the evidence pointed to Anna. When it was revealed that Anna's fingerprints matched those found on the crime weapon, she was handcuffed. After all the necessary procedures, she was taken to a cell. Anna couldn't trust her own memory. That night, she dreamt of Douglas coming for her. They walked down the corridor and suddenly found themselves at their own wedding. Anna ran after Douglas but couldn't catch him. Another bride was waiting for him at the altar. Sloan posted Anna's bail in the amount of $500,000. Until the trial she could be free. Sloan had her doubts about Anna's innocence, since she had been obsessed with that family and with Lisa. But Anna knew she wasn't capable of such a brutal crime. As soon as Anna got home, there was a knock on the door. It was Neil, who showed Anna a gun and threatened that if she ever came near him or Emma again, he wouldn't hesitate to use it. Anna felt very alone. That night it rained. Since she had poured out all the wine earlier, she had nothing to drown her emotions. Upstairs a strange sound echoed again. Grabbing a knife, Anna went upstairs. A red substance was leaking from the attic. Dropping the knife, Anna immediately called her therapist, hurriedly explaining that there was something in the attic. Maybe Anna had really taken Chastity's life because she wanted to steal her life. It turned out that Anna's therapist had been her ex-husband all along. They both blamed themselves for what happened to Elizabeth. But maybe no one was to blame except Mike, that serial criminal? They should hate him, not themselves. Douglas advised Anna to face her fear and go up to the attic. Though it was hard, Anna did just that. It turned out that the red substance was only spilled paint. Anna couldn't understand if she was capable of harming Chastity. Suddenly she remembered painting Chastity and shredding the canvas. So her memories of taking Chastity's life were false. But who then had planted the spatula at the crime scene? It likely happened the night Anna passed out on the road because of the rain. The mailman was the only one who could have entered her house. Seeing an improvised bed and food in the attic, 
Anna realized that Buell had been living here all this time. This explained the noises Anna kept hearing in the house. Douglas confessed that Buell had been his patient in the past. He had taken the lives of his entire family but was found insane and acquitted after treatment in a psychiatric hospital. Anna was furious that her ex-husband hadn't told her this from the beginning. It was likely that Buell had taken Anna's spatula. Naturally her fingerprints were on it. Douglas told his ex-wife to run from the house immediately. Looking through the front door window, Anna saw Buell walking toward the house across the street, holding a hammer. Despite her fear of the rain, Anna ran outside but a panic attack made her fall. Remembering her daughter, Anna realized she had to overcome her fear for Emma's sake, and she succeeded. In the neighbor's house, Anna saw Buell on the floor with a fatal wound. His last words made Anna understand that he wasn't the real criminal after all. Neil sat lifeless on the couch. Emma stood nearby with a knife in her hand. She said she had always hated adults. It was Emma who took the life of chastity, whom she had never liked. Emma was smart enough to steal Anna's spatula and thus set her up. Neil hadn't heard anything because he was rehearsing with his puppet in the bathtub. Emma declared that the real monster wasn't her but her mother, who had decided to have a second child without asking the daughter's permission. Now Emma was going to take the life of Anna, the only witness. The teacher by the way had also been one of Emma's victims. The girl attacked Anna, and a struggle ensued between them. Emma who was fighting with increased rage, managed to knock Anna out. Meanwhile, Douglas was already on his way. Emma called 911, claiming that the crazy neighbor had taken her father's life. And the girl allegedly took the neighbor's life in self-defense. But Anna was alive. Emma was about to finish what she started. When Douglas arrived, he found Anna's phone on the road and realized she was in the neighbor's house. Emma had tried to warn Anna earlier, leaving a message on her car window. But since Anna hadn't heeded the warning, she had to pay for it. At the last moment, Anna managed to inflict a fatal injury on Emma. Douglas ran in, begging Anna to stay conscious. Soon Anna woke up in the hospital. Detective Lane visited her with a bouquet of flowers and apologized. Anna had been waiting for those words for so long. Douglas came by too, also with flowers. He informed that Buell was alive and currently in intensive care. This brought Anna relief. Wishing Anna good luck, Detective Lane left. Douglas felt guilty for not believing Anna, just like everyone else. He promised to always be there for her from now on. Carol also visited Anna and apologized. She realized she had been wrong to judge the poor woman and was ready to admit her mistake. Anna was genuinely pleased to hear this. After recovering, Anna returned home. Buell by the way still lived in her attic, but Anna didn't mind anymore. Soon Sloan organized an exhibition at a gallery, showcasing Anna's paintings. Sloan was very proud of her friend. Seeing Douglas with his girlfriend Claire made Anna feel sad. They came over to say hello. At that moment, it was revealed that Douglas and Claire weren't lovers but colleagues. Douglas offered to walk Anna to a cab. By the way he had bought her latest painting. When it started to rain, Anna realized she wasn't afraid anymore. Everything was going to be okay now. Suddenly Douglas kissed Anna. This marked the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. A year later, Anna was preparing to visit Sloan in New York. Meanwhile, Douglas was taking care of their little daughter. Anna never gave up alcohol but replaced wine with vodka. On the plane, a strange elderly woman took the seat next to her. Having had too much to drink, Anna slept for several hours. Then opening the restroom door, she saw the elderly woman lying lifeless. Anna urgently called the flight attendant. But when they opened the restroom door again, no one was there. Moreover, the flight attendant assured her that no one had been sitting next to her. Anna is ready to start her own investigation again. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel not to miss more exciting new products. Also the authors will be pleased if you leave your opinion in the comments.